Welcome back to this is a live this Sunday talk show here on the RS News channel. With me, I still have Professor Bola Kintenova, Director General, Bulletin Center for International Diplomacy and Strategic Studies. Yemi Agamolekun, Executive Director in Office now, and Professor David Awurawa, Professor of International Relations and Strategic Studies at, at the University of Lagos. Well, I just finished speaking with uh, Professor Samuel I.J., uh, Professor Apply of Applied Linguistics, and former Director General of the Nigeria Baragri uh, Center, uh, you know, for foreign affairs uh, here in Lagos. And he has spoken about Nigeria at 62, and also about the coup reported from Burkina Faso and the implications of that for the integrity of the democratic process uh, in Africa. But I have right with me here in the studio, Professor Akintelewa, who has also written a lot on the subject of Nigeria, the making of it, the making of it, and democracy and governance in Africa. Uh, Professor Akintelewa, well, you are over 70, you have seen it all. Uh, Nigeria at 62. Yesterday, the president struck a note of optimism. He even said his government is doing a lot with insecurity. His government is doing a lot with uh, agriculture, you know, and that, uh, well, if there are pains, he as president feels the pains. And he has done his best uh, to at least uh, mitigate uh, corruption leakages uh, within the system. Do you agree with him? when he says particularly that he shares our pains with the ordinary people of Nigeria who are perpetually in pains? Well, on, on a very serious note, it is not possible for any individual to share the pains uh, suffered by an individual. You can have sympathy, but it's not possible for you to know when one is uh, really having the pains. You see, uh, Professor Ajir is a uh, three main points that are quite relevant to the discussion of um, President Buhari's um, um, address. He, he reminded us about uh, 1960. I think uh, I remember that we were given um, brown plastic cups with a uh, national flag we were given um, rice and chicken. By that time, um, I think um, there was no Coca-Cola. We were having this Pepsi, this local something by that time. So we, I remember that. So his, um, Professor Ajay is quite um, right in uh, reminding that, particularly that um, two years after, 1962, uh, there was uh, a major international trade fair that took place in Lagos, which is just to consolidate, to show that Nigeria has actually acceded to national sovereignty. The other point raised by Professor Aji is that um, he believes that um, President Buhari has done his best, but also admitting that uh, doing his best may not um, necessarily meet the expectation of the people. Well, I wouldn't say that he has done his best. Not to talk of saying meeting the expectations of the people. He was the one who told us his agenda, what he wants to achieve. You can have challenges. There's no doubt about that. But if you look critically at his speech, to which I will come um, thereafter, you will discover that on the issue of... Um, um, insecurity. He talked about it very briefly in the opening statements. He came later to it without necessarily expatiating on that. Now, when um, Professor Ajay claims or theorizes that um, a tree does not make a forest, that Buhari has advisors, collaborators, I will agree with him that, yes, he has advisors. But we know that um, in, um, in, in diplomatic practice, international practice, international tradition, please, 
a tree can make a forest. So it's quite different from a um, geographical approach to it. And a good example of that one is the, the introduction of the right to veto. Veto is given to all the nuclear weapon states. So Africa can have uh, 54, 55 votes. The whole world, the whole uh, hunger, General Assembly can vote uh, half majority. But one single veto can neutralize that. The most recent example is basically the annexation by Russia of, um, you know, some regions in, um, in Ukraine. 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 And now they wanted to sanction, condemn Russia, but Russia simply told the whole world to say, please, take, uh, take it. Yeah, cool. but even that and, is uh, contentious. That's why the referendum that was taken, which was teleguided by Russia, uh, with uh, uh, Putin saying that, uh, you know, he has his own idea about how reality should uh, move. But let's yeah, quickly okay. go to Professor Aurawa. Okay. Professor, Professor Aurawa is not there yet. Okay, I'll stay with you, uh, yeah. Professor Akintero. Yes, you see, if you look at the address of um, President Buhari himself, I think the address is most unfortunate. I, I, I look at the first three opening statements. The, the address started with fellow Nigerians. Good. In the past, Buhari talks about compatriots. He will even use an endearing, you know, affectionate words like um, dear, you know, but this time we just said fellow Nigerians. But who are these fellow Nigerians? You will see the expatriation. Who are these fellow Nigerians? Look at what he said in the, in the speech. Fellow Nigerians. He said, because this is most likely to be his last Independence Day anniversary, he is addressing, he is speaking, and I quote, to all Nigerians whose tremendous goodwill gave me the opportunity to provide leadership for a great country. In other words, he addressed himself to people who enabled his leadership, who enabled him to come to power. So those who did not support him, those who are not uh, visibly uh, with him, it's not part of the people to whom the, uh, he was addressing. And um, look at it. He said, I quote again, I speak to the millions of Nigerians who believed in me, propelled and stood by me in my quest to bequeath a country where all citizens have you know, equal opportunities. Why are you always speaking to people who you know? Why are you always speaking to people who voted you in? We are all Nigerians. Okay, we'll he do, we'll he must be respect. a pan-Nigerian president. With due respect, I, I, I get your point, Prof. Okay? But, you know, these guys, <laughs> the Buhari Abyssin, they used to write very bad speeches. Terrible prose, terrible rhetoric. Why is he surrounded by but, bad speech writers? But they have since improved. And I think that even this uh, independence... The improvement speech, is only to the extent that uh, no, now they, it's they no longer improved. gone. No, they have it's improved, a, in my mm. view. That's my personal opinion. And I thought that even this their last, uh, you know, independence day speech, well, it's an improvement. You know, uh, you can uh, expect that a man that is leaving office can attempt some chest beating. He can beat his chest, lose his head. Like you know, Ruben, Ruben... You may not agree with him. Ruben, in terms Ruben, of the stylistics, I look, think they in speech writing, badly. In speech writing. Yes, Prof. Bearing in mind that when you write long speeches, people sleep. They don't even listen. They don't even hear. So you must give priority to the most critical points that are uh, bearing to the president. So when, when you look at it, the grammar, the style, all those things, per perfecto. I will agree with you at that level. But 
when you are projecting a president, please, you do not just come and um, be presenting him as a president of a, a section of the uh, of the country, and that's what the paper is, and that's why it's uh, most unfortunate. Okay, Prof, don't let's argue over it. Okay, we have uh, uh, different styles, but I think they've improved. You know, when it comes to putting the sentences together, which is a very no, no, you are right on that. Yes, for uh, many people. Yes, but but I understand we have Professor David Awolowo. Professor David Awolowo, Nigeria at sixty-two. What do you think? Do you think we fared well, or do you think we're just uh, gambling, fumbling and wumbling as we uh, move along? Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Abati. Um, that is a very simple question to answer. Um, <laughs> we have not fared well uh, using all parameters. Um, the only way to assess how well we are fed is to, you know, look at uh, uh, different sectors, um, the economy, see where we are. Um, we are so, 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 so down in terms of economic development compared with other countries that we are part with us at independence in 1960. Um, you know, Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, all those other countries, uh, you know, that we are part with us uh, in 1960. They've all gone so far, you know, so far ahead of us. So um, we have not done well in terms of the economy. Of course, only recently we came to, we learned that uh, the amount we earn uh, is less than the amount uh, we use to service debt. That summarizes it, that uh, we have not done well uh, in terms of uh, economic development. In terms of security, we see how insecure the country is. Uh, people, the cliche now is I can't travel by road, by air, by land. So how do you move from one point to the other? Um, education, you see where we are. 20 million out of school children. Um, also, we have been on strike for seven months. Uh, the president made reference to it in the, in the, um, you know, the, independ the, the independence they address. But the core issues are not addressed. So uh, we remain where we are. He has made this uh, call several times. Please ask to call, your, call up your strike, go back to work. But the fundamentals, what needs to be done, that he has the powers to do, he hasn't done. So he's just scratching the surface. And he also summarizes uh, the approach to resolving Nigeria's uh, economic problem, I mean, general problems. The fundamentals are not, uh, are not uh, addressed. The superficial and peripheral are focused on. And that's why we have not uh, made progress as we should. Um, is in terms of uh, industrial development, uh, comatose, is in terms of power, um, no power, you know. So uh, the only thing you can thank God for is that we are not in full-scale war and we are alive. At least we can thank God for that. They are, we are still in one piece that uh, the call to your tent to Israel has not uh, come to fruition so that the country has not uh, disintegrated. We need also to thank God for that. Uh, aside from that, um, every other level, every other parameter, every other sector, uh, you know, of uh, the of Nigerian life, we have not done well. Which is why we have to really um, plan well, work hard, do the right things, adopt the right policies, implement those policies conscientiously and uh, honestly, so that uh, we can we can run fast to make up for lost grants moving forward. Quickly, before we talk about Burkina Faso and the crisis of uh, coups in Africa, the resurgence, as it were, of military interventions in Africa, Yemi Adamolekun is here. Yemi Adamolekun, I know you were born after independence, right? Yes, sir. Okay, just, just, thank to, you, thank you, sir. just to be sure. <laughs> That's fine. That's but happy what, to clarify. What, what do you make of your country and the president's speech yesterday? Still giving hope and still beating his chest, saying he has done his bit for Nigeria. What are your expectations going forward? I mean, it's his seventh Independence Day address. And I think for me, it was just really, um, yeah, I think it was, it was sad that it wasn't different. But I don't know that I was expecting any different. I mean, Mr. President is clear. I, let, me, let me take that back. 
Mr. President is not the man, and I think you alluded to this a bit earlier, who reads his speeches, understands it, and then makes it his own it and to. makes it his words. They write a speech for him and he reads it. And so it's the words that I don't think, to, quite honestly, I don't think he fully understands in some of the things that he's talking about. And to, I think, Professor Akintani was earlier point, how you gave the agenda, the economy, corruption, security, you failed on all three. But you're still saying, I don't know about giving hope. He's maybe giving home to himself. But the Nigeria that he met, is certain that he promised to fix, is certainly not the Nigeria he's leaving behind. But he's still quite deluded that they've done well. And I think that for me is quite, it's really quite the shame of it. We've said it on the show several times. It will be the last Independence Day address that we analyze. But the clarity of it is that Mr. President was clear about wanting to become president of Nigeria. But he wasn't clear about what he was going to do and how he was going to do it which is why he gives himself credit for things that are neither here nor there, or is clearly blind or, or to the reality of what Nigeria is. And Nigeria generally, I mean, it's 62 years, we're still having this discussion about if we want to be together or not. We're still having this discussion about reforming the constitution. We're still having the conversation about unity and diversity. Uh, Kadari Ahmed was speaking at Platform yesterday, and she spoke about the power, a parallel to Indonesia about the power in diversity. But Indonesia was able to harness its diversity because they had a, they had, they've had a leadership that understood it and made everyone within the country feel that they have a place. That's not been the case with Nigeria. And it's certainly not the issue of the North doesn't want the South to go because of oil. No, it's because in different parts of the country, people feel that the country has not done well by them. And it's not a function of natural resources, even though that might be the narrative of some people, but I think the general sense is people feel that this country as it currently is, is not working for me. So in, in Nigeria post 62 years, as we go into our 63rd year and another general election, it's a tall order for those who want to uh, lead Nigeria, both at the federal level, as governors, as members of the National Assembly, to speak to a Nigeria, what does that mean? To speak in words that speak to unity, that speaks to giving a space for everyone. Mr. President claims he's done so. I mean, I, I, the first line or so of his statement says when he came in, he wanted to leave a Nigeria behind where everyone felt like they had a place. And honestly, Mr. President really thinks that that's his legacy after seven years. That for me alone says a lot about how disconnected Mr. President is from what he has done. Because ultimately, regardless of the people around him, regardless of what might have been said, done or whatever, the box stops at his table. So whatever Nigeria has become in the last seven years, Muhammad Buhari must take responsibility for it. He doesn't, and that's really actually the, the most unfortunate part of it. He doesn't take responsibility for it, and quite frankly, I don't think he cares. Okay, um, well, thank you for your input with regard to Nigeria and its future and the performance of President Muhammad Buhari. But let's go to Burkina Faso, which presents us with a dilemma, which simply is the recurrence now, the resurgence of military interventions in African uh, uh, countries. When uh, uh, the uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, took uh, power in January, he said he was going to deal with the Islamic uh, insurgents. Now you have uh, Captain Traore, who has pushed him out, uh, that's Lieutenant Colonel Damiba, uh, who also removed uh, Kabore uh, in January. And now you have, in one year, you know, in eight months, two different coup interventions. We've also had coup interventions in uh, Guinea-Bissau uh, and in other countries in Africa, Niger, Chad, where there's so much uncertainty. Okay, are we back to the past in Africa? And what is the role of France in all of this? Because on Friday and yesterday, the French embassy was specially targeted. And the French have been saying, we are innocent in this matter. Let me start with you, Professor Akintenova. According to reports, as given by Ruben now, <laughs> France said we are not involved. Yes, that's what they claim. In diplomacy, it is not known where a country that has taken active part in an act considered Non acceptable who openly come and say, I did it, uh, we did this. It's not done, nobody. So, no one can say France has done this, 
France has done that. And that was what you see when we were discussing <laughs> the issue of a British coach the other time that, look, you see, you have direct statements. You have indirect statements. You also have direct actions. You see, in this particular case, you have raised a number of uh, critical points. First, are we returning to coup making again? So we, Professor Aji, drew attention to say in the 1960s, in the 1970s, what was in vogue was this uh, military takeover. The question is this. When discussing the, the coup in Burkina Faso, there is a linkage to what transpired in Mali. And on this basis, we must ask the question, is the coup a reflection between the emerging or even misunderstanding that has actually emerged between Francophone African countries and France? So the first level of analysis is the misunderstanding between um, Francophone West and Central African countries and France on the one hand. The second level is the misunderstanding between France and Russia. When you look at uh, what happened in uh, Mali, the coup there is on the basis that France had been invited, France was and halfly still actively present in the Sahel region. But in the eyes of the Malians, France has not been seen to have shown capacity and capability to contain terrorist insurgency. And they even think that, look, France was actually aiding and abetting this particular um, terrorism. A lot of money um, he amount for all this, but terrorists were increasingly gaining territorial grants. So they now decided that, okay, look, France, we do not want you anymore. We will want an ally that will sincerely give us help. So they were making use of uh, the Wagner group that has, you know, a closer entente with uh, President Putin in um, Russia. But France was so annoyed that, look, France was not prepared to cooperate, to collaborate with Russia in Mali. Please, now, in the context of uh, Burkina Faso, when French troops were moving to uh, moving from Côte d'Ivoire to go to Niger, Chad, to assist. In Burkina Faso, the people blocked the passage. They didn't allow the French troops to move. That was a problem. So that is to let you know that a misunderstanding between the Francophones already and uh, France existed and still exists. So when you are now trying to explicate, for instance, the dynamics of the current um, coup d'etat, which uh, African leaders, AU, and particularly ECOWAS, are misrepresenting that they have not even understood, most unfortunately, you will discover that we can rightly uh, answer your question, who making has returned. Why? Why? Because, because African leaders are dealing with symptoms. They refuse to deal, deal with, the root cause. with the root causes. And the root cause, basically, is that, look, first of all, look at the statement of uh, the African Union. They say this coup is unconstitutional. So what do you the mean they don't understand? They don't, you said ECOWAS and AU are not understanding the dynamics. Yes, because you oh. must differentiate between coup d'etat and the people's coup. In Mali, mm -hmm. the, the people were already asking for, um, for the 
Malian president to, to shake out. But they were but referring to the Burkina Faso coup, which is what they called it, unconstitutional. It's the same thing because it's, it's a continuation. Please, you see, in uh, Francophone Africa right now, there's a new thinking. They are, they are bitterly complaining about France. Even in Nigeria here, some Nigerians protested against the French in the embassy in Abuja, saying that... Um, in solidarity. France, in solidarity. Saying okay. that, uh, look, um, France is aiding and abetting terrorists. Is there. So the Francophone people now believe that they should bring Russia, who will be more sincere. <laughs> and now France is not uh, prepared for that. France used to be the the agent, the protector of uh, NATO interests in Africa. Mm -hmm. Professor Bassi Artis' book on this is very uh, noteworthy. So, um, if, for instance, the, um, the current uh, coup maker, the captain, is now suspecting that Ibrahim, Ibrahim Traore. Traore. Ibrahim Traore. Now suspect. saying that Damiba must be hiding Either in the embassy, French embassy. Oh, okay, let, let me quickly take uh, Professor Awurawa on this issue of the resurgence of coups in Africa and whether, in fact, indeed, we're you know, witnessing a recursive uh, phenomenon with regard to the democratic uh, experience in Africa. Recursive. We take one step forward, we take two steps backward. France uh, has uh, a great role to play in what has happened. Uh, clearly also, um, coups are making a recrudescence in, in Africa and especially in West Africa. Uh, the, the, the coup leaders have uh, seen a veritable excuse to overthrow government and then come to power. I do not agree with uh, both Damiba when he came in and now Ibrahim Traore as he has come in, uh, that uh, oh, resurgence, uh, terrorism, and then they are coming to, the, the reason for their uh, intervention is to come and uh, deal with, uh, you know, expanding uh, terrorism. I say I don't agree with them for several reasons. One, they have shown themselves to be just adventures like we had in the 60s and 70s where, um, military boys, adventurous military boys, will uh, want to chase political power and then just look for an excuse, you know, to plot a coup. And that is what I see in the, in the experience of Burkina Faso, both Damiba and uh, the Traore coup. I, and secondly, the question we ask is, when Damiba took over government early in the year, what strategy did he have to combat expanding terrorism in Burkina Faso? He didn't have any. It was just a case of, oh, okay, we don't want France, let's see whether we can try uh, Russia. Russia is busy with its own war, you know, uh, with Ukraine. And uh, how much uh, commitment uh, is Russia going to uh, give and then fulfill oh, in helping to <laughs> in Burkina Faso? Uh, the same thing now with Traor. If you ask him, okay, you have uh, overthrown Damiba because of expanding terrorism in uh, Burkina Faso, <laughs> and uh, its environs. Uh, what are the strategies for combating uh, the terrorists? I'm not sure they will have a ready answer. So uh, the conclusion I come to in all of this is that we just have military boys who want to taste political power and uh, using expanding terrorism in the region as an excuse, you know, to, to, to overthrow government. Okay. Um, one final thought, one final comment. Uh, France must be careful because terrorism does not, uh, is not, is not a positive thing for anybody. It's not good for the former colonies. It's also not good for France itself. So there is a need, there will be the need to close ranks so that there will be a concerted effort to tackle these terrorists. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Aurawa. We'll take a short break now. When we return, we'll provide a summary on Nigeria 62 and the coup and the uncertainty in Burkina Faso. And Yemi Adam Alekun will make our contribution with regard to the uncertainty in Burkina Faso. And they will provide that summary and we'll move on to another subject. Stay with us. It's still this day live, the Sunday talk show here on the Arise News Channel. We'll be right back. Stay with us.
The Zenith Better Life promo is back and it's bigger and better. You could be one of 20 lucky customers to win 150,000 Naira every two weeks from now till January 31st, 2023. To qualify, simply open a Zenith Bank account and maintain a minimum balance of 5,000 Naira. For more information, visit www.zenithbank.com forward slash better life. Zenith Bank. In your best interest. These are new types of human beings. They are not demoralized or defeated persons. They are leaders, but are rooted deep among those they lead. We mustn't be victims, but protagonists of our stories. Don't you think it's time things were different? As individuals, we have an impossible battle. As a collective, we stand a chance. titles every day to our awesome collection of blockbuster movies. Download the app and subscribe. This isn't just a streaming channel. This is a bold new world of entertainment. Arise Play. Beyond Streaming. 34 million hectares of arable land. Over 200 million people. One nation. Home to Africa's fertilizer company. Dangote Fertilizer. Pure urea fertilizer. One single-minded passion to feed Nigeria. Every bag is a potential, an aspiration to turn this green nation into the biggest food basket of Africa. Tangote Fertilizer. Every day, life presents hopes, dreams, and challenges. Challenges that can become successes with a little help. Because a little help can empower you to go from despair to celebration. A little help can keep you going until the race is won. A little help can turn bundles of anxiety into a bundle of joy. And with Glow Data, you get much more than just a little help. You get the biggest data deals in town to make every day glow with small wins and big wins. Dial star 777 hash to select your Glow Data plan. Welcome back to this Elijah Sunday talk show here on the Arise News Channel. With me, I still have Professor Bola Kintenewa, Director General of the Center for International Diplomacy and Strategic Studies. Yemi Adamolokun, Executive Director in Office Enough, and Professor David Awurao, Professor of International Relations and Strategic Studies at the University of Lagos. Well, Yemi, just before we take our next uh, topic, I wanted you to to comment on the situation in Burkina Faso. But to also make the point, about Nigeria 62, we're hoping that uh, Senator Adesha yeah. Ogunlewe will be able to join us, but I'm hearing something is not powering up, something is not behaving well, but that's okay. 
you know, I'm, I'm sure I'm used to that by now. However, I think we need to make the point that, look, well, with all our problems, with all our challenges, this is still a good country. This is a country of very resilient people. The majority of Nigerians, they are still very optimistic people. Uh, every day I hear people, uh, they want to japa. People are going to UK, people are going to Canada. But people like you and I, we're still here. And we're in the majority. Because we have hope, we are optimistic, we believe in Nigeria, and we think that this is a country of diamonds. Golden persons, as uh, President Mohamed Buhari uh, pointed out uh, uh, not too long ago, and that, you know, with uh, you know, all of this optimism, that it shall be well with Nigeria, and that even at 62, we have every reason to say, well, this country may be a giant with clay feet, but it's still, you know, a country that many of us believe in. I don't know about Prof. Prof is looking at me with corner, <laughs> corner <laughs> side eye. Yes, uh, but I, I sympathize with you. We should stay. <laughs> Why are you sympathizing? <laughs> I have a right as a citizen to say be I believe in this country. But okay, that's Nigeria. Let's talk about Burkina Faso. You know? I think let, I will start actually with Nigeria before Burkina. I think it's actually quite sad that we're comparing Burkina to the quote and unquote the giant of Africa. And the issue really is not. Uh, the fact that some are here because they believe. A lot more are here because they don't have a choice. If someone gave them a passport and cash and said, you can go to any country you want and you'll be fine, the conversation we'll be having about Jack Bain will be quite on a very different scale. So because you know, you've removed the barrier to Jack Bain. But the more importantly, really, is that people leave in the country, it's not the first time. But the fundamentals is always, if someone left the UK to go to America, it's not headline news because it's a choice. But here, people are forced to because the country does not provide the environment for them, as we say, to live their best lives. And I think we can't dismiss that because some of us choose to say, or some people are here because they don't have that choice. Now, having said that, Burkina and the new wave of, of coups in, in West Africa, I think it's instructive in the larger context, not only of geopolitics that Prof was speaking about, wanting to leave France to go to Russia. The irony in that is a, is a, is a whole... It's a whole um, discussion on its own. But the fact that as a continent, we still haven't quite prioritized our citizens to ensure that what our political class does is in the best interest of citizens. Now, you have Nigeria on one side, you have South Africa on one side, the two quote and unquote largest economies on the continent who are dealing with internal issues, who are not able to provide the leadership that the continent requires. So, in the absence of leadership, where in Nigeria, on that proper circumstances, should be able to like land in Burkina tomorrow and be like, are you people mad? What's going on here? And be able to have a clear conversation that's outside of a France or a Russia, because we've taken on our own destiny, that we're shaping Africa for ourselves, and we're going to shape this narrative. But there's no leadership. I'm sure President Buhari, I'm not even sure he knows what's happening in Burkina or knows anybody to call in that place or can do anything there. Probably even in the days of Olusegun um, Basanjo, he's probably talking to more people in Burkina than President Buhari is. So we've, we've, the, the role that the continent can play in checking itself, we don't, we're not playing that because we haven't taken the time to understand that this is what we want for ourselves. This is what a democracy means. This is what it means to prioritize citizens. So all of us are facing, in a sense, the same direction. So you have the military, as you said, two military coups in eight months. You're not doing well. Yeah, leave. Another person has come in. And as Nigeria has experienced in the past, we will rejoice because we, f we feel that the previous military government wasn't, wasn't serving. And yeah, they weren't serving the citizens. And that's where it is. And in the absence of an ECOWAS or an AU that has both bark and bite, everybody will continue to do what they want. Well, I yeah, think you, it's, you, a, it's a very you unfortunate... See, Yemi, yes, sir. You cannot be more correct on... ECOWAS and AU. Yes, on the <laughs> attitudinal disposition of the president. No, right. Three or four lines. Mm. Statement on Nigeria's foreign policy. Mm. What is this? Nigeria will continue <laughs> with its bilateral and multilateral something to engage, to, to foster cooperation, and so on and so forth. Nothing. Look at that type of state. It does not show any seriousness of purpose. This is an opportunity for, the, uh, for President Buhari, for instance, 
to make a clear statement, a clear statement yes. of Nigeria's policy. Yeah. Either one, we do not, Nigeria will not condone yeah. unconstitutional change of government. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? Even though this unconstitutionality has become ambiguous, we don't really know what it means. But just to so, say that for a democracy, yeah, a military yeah. takeover is unacceptable. And since yeah. Nigeria... Well, since prof, prof, what I, I saw, what I read, is that there was uh, the ECOWAS, the African Union, the United Nations, and also the Nigerian government have very clearly condemned the military intervention in Burkina Faso. Look at the statements. And the United Ruben. States, and the United okay. States yes. has also expressed concern. So in other words, everybody is saying that what has happened in Burkina Faso is illegal, is unconstitutional, particularly at a time when the ECOWAS have been able to put in place a certain program of transition. In fact, the African Union has also given a deadline that by July 2023, uh, Traore and his, uh, and his gang should get themselves out of the place. That is the if, extent. If, if Nigeria's reaction does not go far enough, you can say so. But at least, you know, there, no, there has been Nigeria, properly expressed Nigeria as a regional influential. Yeah. Power. Yeah. Nigeria yeah. as a regional yeah. influential yeah. that has been mediating. Please, Professor Bolaji Akinyemi yeah. went to mediate yeah. crisis in Mali yeah. in the past when he was foreign minister. Yeah. And by that time, we used to have this uh, CEO, Community Economy of Africa, the West, which is the Francophone uh, counterpart of uh, ECOWAS. We know what happened. Nigeria is always on record mm -hmm. to dictate, to define the direction of foreign policy. But what we are now seeing is completely different from that. ECOWAS talks about inappropriate, you know, the coup is inappropriate to the extent of okay. uh, what we have Prof, just said. Prof, that okay, let's come back home. <laughs> How you interpret the text of the intervention, you know, it's up to you. Uh, but let's come back home. On Wednesday, September the 28th, Nigeria officially kicked out the uh, campaigns for next year's presidential election. Contrary to expectation, most of the 18 political parties are here to inaugurate their presidential campaign councils as the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, blew the whistle. A rice correspondent, Amaka Ude Walker, reports. In less than report. five months to the 2023 national and state elections, all is now set for the official commencement of political campaigns on Wednesday, September 28th, as declared by Nigeria's electoral buddy, INEC. And in the build-up to the official flag off of campaigns, candidates and their political parties are putting finishing touches with consultations in top gear. Arise News investigations reveal that major political parties are yet to inaugurate their campaign councils due to infightings on who made the list and who was excluded. I am going to read a very short remark. The inauguration of the campaign council of the governing All Progressive Congress, for example, has been postponed indefinitely with the presidential candidate Bola Tinubu and his rolling mate Kashim Shatima currently out of the country, while the main opposition People's Democratic Party is also yet to inaugurate its campaign council, despite a list of campaign members released with additional special advisors appointed by the presidential candidate Atiku Abubakar. It has fixed Wednesday for the inauguration. The campaign council members and advisors have been at each other's throat over the composition of the team's boat in the APC and the PDP. But surprisingly, Nigerians are yet to also read about campaign council composition from the Labour Party, the New Nigeria People's Party or Social Democratic Party, which individually claim to be the thought force out to dislodge the major parties. One party, the African Democratic Congress, ADC, has released its campaign shadow without naming members of the campaign team. Though campaigns officially begin on Wednesday, no political party has fully released its manifesto yet to the public on what they intend to do if voted into power, while the supporters of some presidential candidates, especially that of the Labour Party, have been carrying out enlightenment campaigns across the country in their numbers, with claims of holding a million-man march in some instances. <laughs> Thank you. 
But in the run-up to the campaigns, some politicians, their supporters and political parties have shown signs of digressing from issue-based campaigns to launch personal attack on opposing parties and candidates based on religion, ethnicity and all the sentiments, especially on social media. In recent times, the social media space has been characterized by such statements like these ones found on Instagram. Over and beyond comments seen as hate speech, it's also in the way and manner some of the supporters engage in online bullying and cast aspersions on opponents while trying to project a right image of their principle to the detriment of others. The microblogging site Twitter also have some of such vile rhetoric targeting opponents through posts, pictures, videos and memes. With several misleading information, this information of fake news being shared on other social media platforms like Facebook and WhatsApp. There is a call by electoral experts for journalists to fact-check politicians, their supporters and political parties. Hold them to account in accordance with Section 22 of the 1999 Constitution as amended to avoid online and offline propaganda that could further unsettle Nigeria's internal security. Media practitioners are also being urged not to allow their platforms be used to instigate violence by favoring particular candidates. Amaka Ude Walker, Arise News. Meanwhile, a day after the first whistle signaling the campaigns, candidates for this year's presidential election converge on Abuja, the nation's capital, to sign a peace pact, an agreement promising to run peaceful campaigns. At the event, the National Peace Committee appealed to all the candidates and the political parties to respect electoral laws before, during, and after the elections. Arise correspondent Chinaza Samuel reports. Here is the report. This is the first peace accord signing ceremony prelude to the 2023 general election. If past experience is anything to go by, getting candidates' commitment to peace is crucial to the success of elections. As the campaigns progress, more agreements are likely to be signed to make sure the candidates remain committed to peace. Here, presidential candidates for the 2023 election sign a peace pact committing to the peaceful conduct of political campaigns and rallies across the country. Present at the accord signing ceremony include the presidential candidates of the main opposition People's Democratic Party, Atiku Abubakar, Rabiu Kwankwaso of the New Nigeria People's Party, Peter Obi of the Labour Party, APC's presidential candidate Bola Ahmed Tinubu, who was conspicuously absent at the event, was represented by his running mate Kashim Shatima, alongside party chairman Abdullahi Adamu. Admonitions by the chairman of the Peace Committee, General Abdusalami Abubakar, to the candidates and their supporters are simply to prioritise peace, shun violence and focus on issue-based campaigns. I'm appealing to the political parties, party chairmen, candidates, and their spokesperson to please campaign on the basis of issues that are of significant concern to Nigerians. Please avoid the spread of fake news, personal attacks, and insults, and comply with the spirit and letter of the accord. The event also availed Nigeria's electoral body, INEC, as well as the Nigerian police force the opportunity to remind political actors of the need to abide by the rules of the game in line with the provisions of the Electoral Act or face sanctions. The Independent National Electoral Commission will vigorously monitor compliance to ensure that parties shun abusive, intemperate or slanderous language as well as insinuations or innuendos likely to provoke a breach of the peace during the electionary campaigns. I have already directed all the commissioners of police across the 36 states of the Federation and the FCT to meet with the leadership of all political parties and the resident electoral commissioners in their states towards mutually evolving the campaign schedules in a manner that will address possible cross-party conflicts in terms of date, time and bend. Some candidates, however, express confidence in the ability of the electoral body to conduct free, fair 
and acceptable elections. In the course of our campaign, we should be mindful of what we say and be able to properly control our supporters and encourage them you know, not to be violent and know how to talk or how to campaign for us. Let's keep hope alive. The election will conduct free and fair where every vote counts and um, create a, a good atmosphere for people to also to vote because there is this agitation that uh, part of Nigerians are complaining of insecurity. Politicians must not em, em, exploit the weaknesses of our people in the way and manner that has made vote buying part of our culture. We hope that with the penalties already spelled out by the chairman of INEX speech and the IG, that those who compromise the process will face the wrath of the law. With the signing of this peace accord by presidential candidates and their party chairman, there is hope that the pre-election, election and post-election actions and all transits of political actors will be guided by a sense of responsibility. Chinaza Samuel, Arise News. With a blast of the whistle from the Independent National Electoral Commission, most of the parties were quick to set their presidential campaign councils in motion ahead of what promises to be one of the most grueling five months of political campaigns in Nigerian history. Critically, the ruling of Progressive Congress has again postponed the inauguration of its 422-member presidential campaign council after several previous de de delays. Arise senior correspondent Indy Amugo reports. When the members of the APC Presidential Campaign Council was announced, the inauguration was slated for Monday, September 26th. In the list, some notable names were missing, particularly that of the Vice President, Yemi Oshibajo, and Secretary to the Government of the Federation, Boss Mustafa. Their exclusion was said to be at the behest of the President, Mohamed Buhari, so that they can run the government while campaigns are on. But considering the controversy generated by the Muslim Muslim ticket, the absence of the two highest Christian members of the APC led federal government on the campaign continues to generate heated debate. Some APC governors have also been opposed to the composition of the campaign council on grounds of not being carried along and their interests not represented. To cushion this observation, the inauguration of the council scheduled for Sunday, September 25, was postponed and a new date of Wednesday, September 28, announced. However, that has now been postponed indefinitely, according to the Director General of the Campaign Council, Governor Simon Lalong. The need to have an all-inclusive campaign council necessitated the second postponement presidential candidate of our, of our party, so there's quite a lot of excitement. So, and as has been uh, propounded and offered by our candidate is basically to allow for more stakeholder engagement. And that engagement, in my view, is currently on, ongoing. Stake, uh, engagement with the party, engagement with our governors uh, for the party had been, uh, had been postponed to allow for wider consultation, uh, stakeholder engagement. But party insiders said the postponement is due to the absence of the presidential candidate, Bola Ahmed Tinibu, and his running mate, Kashim Shetima, both of whom are currently out of the country. In any human affairs, you cannot get it right absolutely because we are not God, we are human beings. So if they need time to dot the I's and the T's, I see no problem. They want the the council to be all inclusive rather than go into the field and discover that a few people have been excluded, which may not work well for the kind of unity they are trying to uh, bring about. It is neither the issue of uh, you know, crisis in the party. It has nothing to do with crisis in the party. As it stands now, even the 42, the 42 membership, is the largest in the annals of presidential campaigns in Nigeria. The PCC itself is not, uh, what you saw is not the, a consummation of, of, of what PCC should be. It is still work in progress. Tinibu has been facing a tough challenge getting the support of some party bigwigs 
over the controversial Muslim Muslim ticket. And with many of such persons excluded from the list, some APC leaders say he is set to face more challenges ahead if the list is not rejected. They said the postponement may be a reaction to the cause for an all-inclusive list, while the governors would also have their way. D. Amuko, Arise News. Okay, let's now turn to our panelists for their perspectives on these developments. And I would like to start with you, uh, Yemi Adamolekun. INEC has blown the whistle. The police say they are ready. INEC says it is uh, fully prepared. Every other major institution, they see all the security agencies are saying they are ready. The political parties, are they ready? The candidates, are they ready? 18 uh, of the candidates, the 18 political parties, signed the uh, peace accord. Peace accord. Uh, at the end of the day, some of the political parties are saying, well, we are not ready with our manifesto yet. We are not ready with our campaign council yet. Is anybody ready? Although we are five months. What do you think? You watch that space closely. I mean, to be fair, it's the longest campaign period that we've had ever. So I, I can understand political parties sort of like beginning with caution, because five months is a lot of time to spend money. Five months is a lot of time to do rallies, engage people. So I can, I can understand the, the slowness in getting started. But I think even without a manifesto that's in a proper document and pretty with the bells and whistles, I think what we need to start hearing from presidential candidates is li literally a bit of what it is you're going to do. What are your priority areas? We can, we can flesh it out with a document later. Um, I think Atiku had a video that he that kind of gave an overview. I haven't heard anything from Peter Obi. Ashiwaju is not in the country and hasn't said anything either. So I think in that space, and obviously quite, quite so either. I mean, then after those four, there are 14 others that either we don't know their names because they also haven't, haven't really said much. So that's that on the political party bit. The peace accord is a good way to start, a good way to kickstart the process. It's a people signing and basically being present. I think it is instructive that the APC uh, candidate was not present. And that says a lot without really clarity about why he was not present. The date had been set, everybody else, 17 out of 18. So that, I think, was very interesting. And tied to that also is the crisis within the APC around their campaign council. So actually, not just the APC, both major parties have had challenges within their parties, their campaign council, or in the PDP case, uh, just the party generally, who's aligned with who in terms of who, who got the nomination and who didn't get the nomination. And on the other side is the Labour Party candidate, who, whose supporters are much louder <laughs> than he is. And, and I think what we would hopefully see over the next five months is more coming from the candidate himself than his supporters. A lot of people are reacting to the campaign based on what his supporters are doing or saying, not necessarily what the candidate himself is doing or saying. So that, that, would, that should change. So that's that on the political party end. On INEX end, yeah, they've blown the whistle, but to say they are fully ready, I don't think that's accurate. PVCs have not been completely distributed. It's not that you have ballot papers. It's not that, I mean, there's still a bunch of lawsuits. So names are likely going to change, as we will start seeing by order of the courts, by order of the courts. So I think that for INEX to say they are ready in that regard, I'm not quite sure it's accurate. But they are ready to the degree that they're following their timetable. And they've set uh, 28th, they've, in a sense, flagged it off. And this is just for president and national assembly members. Governor and state house of assembly members, they flag off this month of October. And what was the other bit? And then the security forces. I think also very hard for security to say that they are ready. Because part of the challenge we'll look at as we get closer is part of the country that will not be able to have elections. This is not Ikiti or Anoshun where literally you can shut down your security apparatus and focus on one state. You have to run elections in 36 states and the FCT at the same time with a security force that over the last two months we've seen protests, poor working conditions, people being unhappy, and this is police and military. And I think those things, to disregard those things and say you are ready for an election that where money is going to play a very heavy role, I don't think does justice to the context of the elections that we're, that we're going into. No, I mean, I don't know. I, I... I not agree more. I get your points, you know, uh, all the points that you have raised. But let's go to Professor Awurawa. Professor Awurawa, INEC has blown the whistle. 
the campaigns have started, what are your concerns? What are your expectations? Um, security is my greatest concern, really. Uh, the, the, the comments by the uh, police uh, chief that the security is ready, I do not uh, uh, subscribe to that because uh, we are all, we are conscious of uh, the security challenges that parts of the country uh, face. And uh, th these security concerns are real, they are genuine. Uh, if elections are, are to be held today, Will elections, will the security forces be able to handle those flashpoints in Kaduna, in Zamfara, in Kasina? Uh, so rather than say they are ready, uh, security forces should uh, step up their game to ensure that um, you know they are able to tackle the terrorists and ensure a higher level of security as uh, we go closer to uh, the election. Um, we recall that uh, in the last cycle, the, I mean, the one before the last, the presidential election had to be postponed because uh, of security concerns. Um, the National Security Advisor at the time said that the analysis, the assessment of the situation was such that uh, they couldn't conduct election in uh, all parts of the country and the election had to be postponed. So uh, that is an area that attention will need to be paid to. The second aspect that is concerning is this vote buying thing. Um, the security forces again, their their um, presence will be required. The attention will be needed to ensure that uh, the elections are not determined by how much a candidate has to offer. Um, you know the electorates. That is very very critical. The equity election that we are praising. Um, well, we are not sure who would have won if uh, money didn't change hands as much as it did. Osho was better than the kitty because they managed to ensure that vote buying was less in Osho than the kitty. Uh, so these are things that will need to be you know, addressed very seriously uh, as we move towards uh, the election. We have said it before, and we are reiterating over and over again, the INS should design the polling structure such that agents do not see who uh, electorates are voting for to confirm whether they will pay somebody and then confirm that they is voting for their candidate and then pay. That should be attention to that very seriously so that uh, vote by will not determine, you know, who wins the election and who does not win. Uh, these are critical issues. Of course, INEC has a whole lot. The postponements we have had in the last two cycles of election, that sometimes a few hours to election, we hope that will happen this time. Because in those two last cycles, the INEC uh, chairpersons then came to say they were ready, only for them to come just, uh, you know, uh, in the second one, a couple of hours to election, that the election will have to be postponed. And uh, even when people had even got to polling booths, that they should go back home and uh, return for uh, the election another another day. We hope that all of those uh, I's will have been dotted, the T's will have been crossed, so that we don't have that this time. One final thing, um, what, you know, uh, uh, what, Political party leaders and uh, uh, observers have, you know, uh, paid attention to. Even former President Jonathan also talked about it. This state speech, you know, ta targeting uh, individuals, targeting candidates, putting, you know, out of putting out their information that is not correct about candidates, you know, and all that. That that attention we need we need to be paid to that. How to reduce at the barest minimum, such that you know, election does not become like uh, like war. Um, at the end of the day, of course, the candidates, the uh, whistle has been blown, some are not ready. A couple of them have put out their information right there. Yemi just mentioned it. Uh, Atiku Abubakar has uh, mentioned his five point uh, uh, agenda. He also posted a document long ago, you know, uh, you know that uh, summarizes what he wants to do. What we need to hear more is how they will do it moving forward. Peter B2 has shown that he understands the problem. But he hasn't said much about how he hopes to address them if you know he's elected. All of these things are the things we need to you know hear more of as we progress towards the election. Okay, uh, Professor Kintenawa, I'm sure you will not uh, find it difficult to agree with some of the points <laughs> raised by Professor Aurawa. 
The fact yeah. that, look, there are challenges ahead. Uh, despite all the protestations of good faith, the promises of good intentions uh, by the various institutions that are involved in this process. But apart from addressing all of that, what do you also think of the symbolism, the significance of the peace accord that was uh, organized by the National Peace Committee led by General Abdul Salami Abubakar, Bishop Matthew Azankuka, the Sultan of Sokoto, and others? Very honestly, I agree to a limited extent with uh, Professor Aburao. I agree with him that uh, there are many, many challenges ahead. But what is a peace accord? What does it mean? <laughs> it doesn't mean anything to me. There are critical issues. You see, all these peace agreements, uh, INEC uh, coming out with policy statements, People saying um, debate or you want uh, issue-oriented campaigns. They do not reflect the situational reality of the voters on ground. Let's take them one by one. For instance, um, we are talking about issue-based campaigns. My own understanding of that one is that you can have two, all the presidential candidates debating issues. Peter or B can talk about econometrics, can talk about macroeconomic questions, etc. all along. Now, those who are going to vote, they are not microeconomists, macroeconomists, they are not econometricians. The, the pattern of voting here doesn't uh, care much about foul language, about uh, hate speech. Please, right from 1960 to date, the pattern of uh, campaigns that people like is when you are able to outsmart your um, competitor in, uh, in foul languages, <laughs> all right? They will use your, your house, your family, etc., to abuse. The more you are able to do that, <laughs> the more pleasant. Please, look at um, the video made by Dino Melai. Now, using the Oshun state uh, election. He started his uh, narrative with um, the origins of uh, Bola Tinubu, saying he's from Oshun state. Tinubu, you lost your state of origin, where you came from, etc. all along. He was weeping in the video. <laughs> now, if you see that one, you will discover <laughs> that's what the Nigerian people will... Is <laughs> Look, it's very interesting. Now, people do not vote on the basis of uh, the extent of goodness of your debate. People. The people who will vote, the, the elite, in terms of uh, percentages, no, is the grassroots people, the market people, but that or might not. change. And I think I, maybe that's what we need to focus on for hmm. 2023. That that might be a different dynamic. If we're dealing with voter turnout of 35 percent, and you have more people who are engaged, more people who had never vote, voted before, or who newly picked up their PVCs because they're angry or they're upset at the APC administration and want to vote them out. So I don't think. While I hear you around patterns and trends, I don't think we can then use that to project what. Who would engage in that is one very good dynamic you have uh, identified. And that's the point I'm trying to raise that, look, you see, when we say issue-based, let's take the economy, the security, and democracy, the three um, triangular pillars that... Um, the Buhari, Buhari, yes. All right. So you, you discover that people are not looking at um, what the administration has done. In a nutshell... But on the if, economy, they will, because the economy is bad. So it's a function please, of what the administration If has a done. President Muhammad Buhari mm. can put in black and white in his uh, um, October 1, 2022, independence uh, anniversary speech... That he read. That, <laughs> that uh, he did well, etc. That's, that's the president telling you that he has done X, Y, Z. Then why would you expect that uh, the voters also 
will be looking at the goodness of all those things. But I'm no, not disputing them. No, will be looking at their own reality. He is saying he did okay. well. I am saying that price of pure water has gone up, price of bread has gone up, price of everything has gone up. Yes, so precisely. I'm People disagreeing know. with you that you have not done well. Because it's no. easy, because in my day-to-day -day life, what you have said is not my situation and reality. So it's easy to compare. So it's easy to have a conversation around the economy. It might be harder to have a conversation, for example, maybe around corruption, quote and unquote. Okay. But it's also very easy to have a conversation about security yeah, because man. it affects all No, no, yes, you can discuss level. you can discuss all these issues. Prof. But who are those to understand the impact, the implications they for voting? To. Prof, would, Prof, we need to take a break now. Ah, right. We'll take a short break uh, on that note. And then when we return the conversation, we'll continue. We'll move on to another topic. Stay with us. You see, this is a live, this Sunday talk show. Yeah, on our Rice News channel. We'll be right back. Still. Welcome back to this a live this Sunday talk show here on the Rice News channel. I still have with me Professor Bola Kintenwa, Director General of Tech Center for International Diplomacy and Strategic Studies. Yemi Adamalekun, Executive Director in Office and Health, and Professor David Awurawa, Professor of International Relations and Strategic Studies at the University of Lagos. Nigeria. Let's talk about flooding. There's been a quiet devastation of communities in North Central Nigeria by floods following weeks of intensive rains. The worst hit uh, parts include large parts of Lokoja, the capital of Kogi State, where rivers Niger and Benue meet at a confluence. Earlier, a warning was issued to communities across riverine areas to evacuate ahead of forecasts of major rivers busting the banks. Major roads have been taken over by flood, while many commuters use Keno as a means of transportation to move from one area to another in the affected communities. Many communities in neighboring Niger state are also underwater, a situation that has been made worse by water released from the Lagdo Dam in Cameroon. In the meantime, President Muhammadu Buhari has charged the National Council on climate change to formulate appropriate policies towards achieving green growth and sustainable economic development for Nigeria. Buhari said the inauguration marked the commencement of the implementation of the Climate Change Act 2021 and a new chapter in the renewed response to climate change in the country. He also directed the Attorney General of the Federation and Minister of Justice to liaise with the Minister of Environment to initiate appropriate amendments of noticeable implementation challenges inherent in the act. Well, Professor Akintera, let me come to you very briefly, because we seem to be running out <coughs> of time. Nigeria is a signatory to the Climate Paris Agreement. Every year, our president goes to the uh, you know, uh, United Nations General Assembly. He talks about climate change and Nigeria's commitment and the uh, responsibility of the developed countries every year we suffer from flooding. Every year, we hear that they release uh, 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 water, water in the Lagdo Dam from uh, Cameroon. Cameroon. And then the low-lying areas of Plateau, Benue, Niger, Taraba, Niger State, they suffer. But we just pay lip service to climate change. We're doing nothing. So now we have a National Council on Climate Change. What are they doing exactly? Do you have any idea? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I always like your observations and questions. You see, I'm happy that um, you said every year we are faced with this uh, problem. President Buhari himself noted in his uh, General Assembly statement that since he came to power, he had been discussing raising the issue of climate change in his address and addresses. He, he drew attention to that. Now, when you know quite well that flood has become a recurrent problem, and you ask the question, or you, you, you say we are paying lip service, that is true. It's worse than paying lip service. The critical problem to address is that Lado Dam um, it's an issue that had been agreed to at the level of Nigeria and Cameroon. 
But Cameroon is on record to have hardly respected that agreement. When it is convenient for Cameroon, they release, you know, they open the gates of their dams. That's what is generally causing the problem. And in this particular case, the uh, Nigerian government is not on record to have challenged, to have taken Cameroon seriously on that particular policy. So you can set up as many councils as possible. The moment you know the, the, the main problem and you do not address that, the council becomes meaningless. Please, it is not only Lagdo Dam that is the issue. When you look at um, Lake Shard Basin Commission, now we are having a um, flood also, this problem in that area. Nigerian government, if it wants to address this problem beyond, beyond um, having a early warning uh, mechanisms in place, climate change, we have been told that there will always be flood. Now, if the government of Nigeria does not build counter dams as well, in different places, the, the, the flow, the direction of um, River Niger, River Benue, and the waters coming from um, Lagdo Dam that are released. All that Nigerian government could do for the purpose of the future is that the desertic areas in the north all along, let's channel, let's divert these waters to uh, such areas in such a way that even if Lagdo Dam is uh, released, you know, it's open for for many many weeks. We will be able well, you are going to maintain. Too far. The Cameroonians have been, uh, you know, releasing water and uh, disturbing us for years. <laughs> Can't you also open the dam from our end and flood the uh, Cameroon? Ah. No, it doesn't work. Yes, it's, it's called retaliatory action. Uh, no, no, diplomacy. It's a legitimate uh, self-defense in this case. Yes. But when you have an agreement, all right, that is uh, either ill or well defined. You need to keep to it strictly. What normally so happens? Keep, so who's not keeping to the agreement? It's Cameroon. Look, right from 1960 to date, please, every March 10, every March 10, they celebrate this day in uh, Cameroon, a day when um, Cameroon lost um, um, a community land to Nigeria to become part of Sadana basis. So they, they think that, look, this Nigeria, they must find a way of dealing with us in a, in such a way. Prof, so, we too should retaliate. Let's flood their planes. No, but there are Nigerians there too. Many <laughs> Nigerians are living there. So you kill yourselves by just retaliating. <laughs> okay. So strategic let me, calculations. Let's have <laughs> Professor <laughs> Professor Aurora's uh, input very briefly. We're running out of time, Professor. Well, um, my my position is a little different. Um, it pains me when we identify a problem and we are unable to, you know, um, proper solution. This water, this flooding has been, a, you know, a regular thing, a recurrent thing that we ought to have been able to find solution to by now. Um, I, I watched a program in the course of the week, somebody from the, you know, the Ministry of the Environment, who said that the agreement actually was that that dam, when the Cameroonians built the dam, it was agreed that Nigeria would also have a dam at this end, such that before they release their own water, they would inform Nigeria, and the Nigerians dam will capture some of the water from the other side. But the Nigeria never really put, put the infrastructure on this other side, which is why when Cameroon release, releases water, it becomes flooding, it causes flooding. I don't know how true that is, but whatever it is, there needs to be more cooperation between Nigeria and Cameroon to ensure that one country does not just release water and it floods another country in that way. In that way, we will be able to manage the flooding and reduce, you know, the destruction. The second level has to do with those who build to block, you know, the, the, the uh, 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 flow of water. That needs to be handled effectively by us if we want to really tackle this flooding you know, very well. The third, those who live on lowlands, what can be done to help them move to higher grants? 
because flooding will take place anyway and it will cause disruption and destruction. The way to you know overcome it is to do one of these three things. Where, you know, engage Cameroon on the release of water from the dam, ensure that people don't build on, you know, water, the area that water flows through, so that water can flow through and there will not be flooding. And then third, those who are on low lands, who would normally experience flooding, what can be done to assist them to move to higher grants so they don't experience uh, the pains of flooding? Okay, you mean quickly. The last word on this, we have just a minute left. I will commend uh, President Buhari on signing the Climate Change Act last year. It's taken him a year to set up the council. But unfortunately, also in that time, there are provisions in the act that he said, for example, setting up um, offices in every zone and every state that would increase bureaucracy. Amendments to the act that have not been done since last year. And I tie this to this issue of flooding. If we are not serious about identifying problems and having a plan to solve them, we will keep having these issues every year. And the case of the act not being amended till now is a good example. Okay, clearly we need to take climate change more seriously and we need to uh, pay closer attention to our obligations at bilateral levels, uh, you know, at all levels. Well, thank you very much for watching. You've been watching This Day Live, the Sunday talk show here on Arise News. I'm Ruben Abati. From my entire team here in Lagos, it's bye for now. And thank you very much for watching. We'll see you again next week.